Hello, Tudor-minded people. It's Philadelphia Carrie for Tudor Time Machine. The expression I share with you this week is candle waster. Well, I admit at times I have wasted candles in search of general joy. I am a person who loves earthly dignity if it is not too much of a dull thing. And indeed, I am no slugabed. But I will tell you that once a princess came to visit my great Queen Elizabeth, and every night was a brabble and candle wasting. It was the Princess Cecilia Vasa. Some said she came to spy on the Queen. Some said she came to convince the Queen to marry her brother, the King of Sweden. But I believe this Vasa came for cakes and wine and midnight volta. The Queen bequeathed a generous allowance, but Princess Cecilia Vasa spent it all away for us to enjoy. Some said she should pay her debts to grocers and loot makers and even the butter makers, for they all hounded the poor lady for a coin. It is disgraceful to hound a princess for a pence and call her a candle waster. Candle waster. How now, Tudor Files? What think you? If you're new here, I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. And we're here with Philadelphia Carey for Tudor Word of the Week. Don't miss a word and listen to the Tudor Time Machine Story Project. So diverting. Subscribe on YouTube and give me a like. Tudor Files, thank you for listening. Every one of you has the wit of Rosalind and the heart of Cordelia. And thank you for writing to Philadelphia on YouTube and suggesting words. We love hearing from you. And how do you spell our Tudor expression this week, Philadelphia? It is spelled C-A-N-D-L-E-W-A-S-T-E-R. Candle waster. And a candle waster is someone who will stay up all night wasting the candles. So in our example, this refers to someone who parties all night. But in the 16th century, they also used it to mean someone who studied all night. So you could be a kind of a wild and crazy candle waster or a bookish candle waster. I mean, the student as candle waster seems a bit unfair. Why should you study at night? You should study during the day and use the sunlight. If you must study at night, you are a sluggard. I have to disagree. Some people study better at night. They're more focused. So they may tell you, but it is not true. Oh, dear Gage, you shall try to tell me not to vent my wrath at lazy people, for they do nothing. <laughs> okay, I think calling someone a candle waster is really about expense, Philadelphia. I think beeswax was very expensive, and they didn't want to waste it. And insulting them discouraged people from staying up late burning candles because it made it seem like it was a character flaw. Hmm, perhaps there is some truth in that. For is not condemnation a fine way to motivate? Beeswax candles cast the most beautiful glow, but even at court we must often use tallow candles, not beeswax. Dim, sputtering things that tallow candles are. It must have been dim in Shakespeare's theater. Well, the Globe was an open-air theater and plays were done during the day. But later in 1608, towards the end of Shakespeare's career, some of his plays were presented at the Blackfriars Playhouse, and that was indoors, and it was lit by candles. It sounds so atmospheric. I should name it Smoky. There were at least a hundred candles, and stagehands were always running here and there to care for the candles. I prefer the outdoor stage, although the Blackfriars audience was more exclusive, more of my rank. I think the play, our word of the week is taken from, would be so wonderful performed outdoors. So the play is Much Ado About Nothing, definitely a fresh air comedy. As with all Shakespeare's plays, we don't know exactly when it was written, but it's usually placed in about 1598. And probably the first performance was a bit later than that. Much Ado is one of those comedies that closely veers towards tragedy because in it, there's a funny trickster who tries to ruin a young girl's reputation, and frankly, life, by saying that she has had sex before she was married. Hmm, that is not a funny trickster. That is a mean M, mm, <laughs> because that could have really hurt her chance at marriage and really limited her life. It seems like it's much ado about something very important. 
I agree. And bizarrely, when it's revealed that she's innocent, then she's happy to marry the guy who cast her aside and publicly humiliated her. My dear Gage, he is an excellent match. Why should such a misunderstanding stop them? Not acceptable. But when she's shamed in front of her father, he is crushed. He just can't believe it. And her uncle, and strangely, the priest, think it might turn out all right. And they say to the father that he just needs to have patience. But of course, her father is so upset and he thinks it's very difficult to have patience. What does he say, Philadelphia? He says, bring me a father that so loved his child and bid him speak of patience. Measure his woe the length and breadth of mine and let it answer every strain for strain as thus for thus and such a grief for such in every lineament, branch, shape, and form, if such a one will smile and stroke his beard, bid sorrow wag, cry hmm, when he should groan, patch grief with proverbs, make misfortune drunk with candle wasters, bring him yet to me, and I will gather patience. Mm. I love the line, patch grief with proverbs. I know. It's like when something terrible happens and someone says to you, well, at least it's not cancer. It's so annoying. Indeed. And yet he may be up all night with worry. And what will he be then? Give heed to the files. Bring some 16th century sauce to your vocabulary with candle waster. Don't miss a word. Listen in next time and give me a like. (laughs) 